a 61-year-old father drops off the grid. I dialed him many times and was quite frantic. Can you please pick up your phone? And nothing about it feels right. The house sold for under market value. That would never be something that he would do. I send a couple still shots to his daughter. She says, that's not my dad. I really begin to think, this is a crime. And later, Callahan and I revisit a horrific cold case in Florida. Right in broad daylight. And he says to me, mommy's gone. I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean mommy's gone? Where a serial offender attacks women and children at an upscale shopping center. A Boca Raton woman was discovered shot to death in a nearby road. Three people are dead, and he's still out there. The victims, why them? It could have been anybody walking out the door. Here's a woman with a seven-year-old, or here's a woman with a three-year-old. This was a hunter of women and children, a thrill killer who planned it and had a kill kit. It breaks my heart that Nancy died tortured, Joey died tortured. We're gonna get that son of a bitch. Please, I hope so. I'm John Walsh, and this is In Pursuit. Our first story takes place in the bright lights of Las Vegas, Nevada, where 61-year-old retired accountant David Rathman had recently moved looking for adventure. The father of two embraced his new life, quickly becoming active in clubs, exploring the outdoors, and forging new friendships. But when David begins acting out of character, not answering calls, and finally going silent, his daughters become concerned and they reach out to police only to discover that their father may have inadvertently opened his doors to danger. A divorced father of two, David Rathbun, retired from his accountant job in July of 2015 and moved to Las Vegas months later. His motto was, if there are palm trees, then I'm on vacation, and there are lots of palm trees in Las Vegas. He really immersed himself in Las Vegas. He joined a bowling club, a hiking group, and motorcycle group. My dad opened up quite a bit. He kind of let loose. With his children and siblings spread across the country, David kept in regular contact, preferring phone calls to text. We would talk every couple of weeks. And then I would make sure I would come out to Las Vegas every other month, and he would make trips to Salt Lake to see me. A gunman perched on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort had opened fire on 22,000 concert goers. On October 1st of 2017, I was living in New York City after I learned that the Las Vegas shooting had occurred. I reached out to my dad. He was such an avid concert goer. I just wanted to make sure he was safe. My mother, my sister, my aunts, my uncle, everyone was a little concerned that we couldn't actually get him on the phone. And then he responded and said he was okay. I was relieved, and then I tried to engage in conversation, and I wasn't getting a lot of responsiveness. When I asked for him to text everybody, he said he was just quite busy at the time, but I was off-put a little bit. As the days pass, David's family only gets text messages from him, and they grow concerned. My aunt called me, and she said, I can't get your father on the phone. And I immediately dialed him many times and was quite frantic. Just being like, answer your phone, please. Can you please pick up your phone? He sends me this one text message that said, did someone die? If not, it can wait. He's never 
been that short with me. The fact that he was trying to halt the conversation was concerning to me. He did promise to call everybody, but no one ever got, got a phone call. Two weeks pass, and Natasha is still only getting texts from her dad. I was quite insistent that I needed to hear his voice. One text from her dad is a total surprise. His response was, you know, I have a new wife. Just like that, her dad delivers a bombshell. My dad had been married three times, and we kind of had a running joke that I said, three strikes, you're out. Maybe he just fell instantly in love, but my dad did not make impulsive decisions. Then the situation becomes even more concerning. My uncle received a call from a, a woman named Jo, who had said my dad was trapped in the bathroom and that he was not feeling well. And then Jo hung up. The name Jo did ring a bell. When Natasha visited her dad in Las Vegas in August 2017, he told her about a woman he met a few weeks earlier named Jo. She was a woman who was down on her luck, uh, was homeless, living in a shed, and she had cancer. She had like a dozen children, and he wanted to help her. It was a friendship that had developed between my dad and Joe. David invited Joe to move into his house, but only weeks later, he changed his mind. My dad was planning to ask Joe to leave, but her boyfriend, Charles, was staying at the house and he wasn't feeling comfortable. No one has actually heard David's voice in over two weeks, and the mysterious call from a woman named Joe alarms his family. My Aunt Linda reached out to the Las Vegas PD. They went to conduct a wellness check at 11 p.m. We sent a patrol officer to the home. Looking through the windows, they could see that the house was currently empty. Worried, David's family starts their own investigation. At that point, Natasha decided to look up the history of the house and saw that it was sold recently. And it was sold for under market value. We knew that would never be something that he would do. She started to do a bit more digging into it and started to see that the signatures didn't match up. He had a chicken scratch signature that you could spot from a mile away. It wasn't his signature on any of the forms. I thought the worst pretty immediately. About two weeks after the Vegas shooting, we reported my dad missing to the Las Vegas PD on October 16th. The first thing I do when I get a report is I start checking databases. But I didn't find David in a police report. I didn't find him at the coroner's office. I didn't find him at all. The next step is I'm going to pick up a phone. I'm going to call. Just because they won't talk to their family doesn't mean they won't talk to me. Ultimately, I reached an individual on David's cell phone who stated that he was David. He was able to provide identifying information. And he explained that he had been diagnosed with cancer and was moving to Houston to get additional treatment. He says he hadn't been speaking to his family because he was having trouble coming to grips with his possibly pending um, death. When Detective Siegel tells David's family about the conversation, the family is stunned. It was very shocking. My dad never mentioned having cancer to us ever. Even though the police are on the case, David's family continued their own investigation. They notice a wire transfer from one of David's bank accounts to a person none of them knew. And we were able to find the Facebook page for the man that the money was sent to and started going through his friends list. And that's when we noticed that he had an ex-wife named Jolene Hibbs. His daughters wondered, could Joe's full name 
B. Jolene Hibbs. I went to her Facebook page. There was a photo of her in my dad's house. David's daughter shared this information with the police. And detectives discover through social media that Jolene's in a relationship with a man named Charles Oswello. I start looking into their criminal histories. We believe that Jolene and Charles use drugs. And the last drug of choice that we knew of was methamphetamine. I see that Jolene is wanted for a probation violation and that Charles was convicted of robbery, drugs, and a shooting. It's another piece that makes you believe that David was a victim. If you've seen Jolene Hibbs or Charles Oswello, please text or call our hotline. I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Now it's time for one of the most powerful weapons in our arsenal, something I like to call 15 seconds of shame. Jamaican-born Ronald Folks is wanted out of Palm Beach, Florida for lewd assault and having sex with a child. He has a scar on his forehead and wears gold teeth. If you've seen Ronald Folks, please text or call our hotline. When Las Vegas police learned that David Rathbun was in the company of Jolene Hibbs and Charles Oswello, they believe that David is the victim of foul play. And his family insists to police that his house was sold fraudulently. I was able to look at property records and see who had handled some of these transactions. The check written to David had been deposited in Bank of America. A new account had been opened to deposit that. The parties involved with the house sale tell Detective Siegel that the man showed them a valid driver's license. It was David Rathbun's. Detective Siegel asked the bank to compare current photos of David to the man caught on bank security video. They said, we don't think the person in the video is David. So immediately, that's a giant red flag to me. I immediately send a couple still shots to Natasha, his daughter. She says, that's not my dad. Right then and there is when I really begin to think, this is a crime. In the pictures, it was Charles Oswello. Detectives get permission from the new owner to search David's house. The house was completely empty. It had been thoroughly cleaned. The person who bought the home from the suspects actually commented that he didn't have to bring a cleaning crew in or anything. The house was that pristine. And in a spare bedroom, we noticed that the carpeting in the closet did not match the carpeting in the rest of the house. And there were several spots of touch-up paintwork done in the closet. That indicated to me that the suspects had done something in that closet that they were trying to conceal. Our crime scene investigation people brought out alternative light sources, and that revealed a significant amount of blood spatter on the closet walls. Detectives obtained DNA samples from David's daughter for comparison. Meanwhile, police want to find Jolene and Charles. I believe their lifestyle is that of a typical methamphetamine addict. They bounce from house to house, I believe. They're kind of typical grifters, which makes them tough to track. But they were known to frequent the southeast part of Las Vegas, uh, particularly what is known as the Boulder Highway Corridor. People who I'd interviewed stated that sometime around the end of October, they just quit seeing and hearing from Charles and Jolene. So they had probably cleared out of town. Later, DNA results from the blood evidence that was collected at the house confirms their suspicions. It was a match. I'm just numb at that point because you're just finding out so much information. I was gutted because all the scenarios that had been playing in my mind for months now had some evidence for why that could be true. Police released pictures of Jolene and Charles to the media, hoping for a tip. But weeks pass, and they come up empty. Then, two months later, in June of 2018, someone finally comes forward to tell his story to police. 
the source knew Jolene and Charles from the Boulder Highway area. He knew about David, and she kind of bragged about all she was scamming off of him. Detective King's source claims that Jolene asked him to help her empty out David's house. On the last trip to David's house, Jolene took the source to the garage and told the source that she needed him to get rid of that and pointed to what appeared to be a human body wrapped in bedding. He said that Jolene helped him load the body into his vehicle, and then he took it out to the desert, very remote location. On the way, the source began to think that he may be killed while out in the desert as well. The source tells police that Jolene was tailing him on the desert highway. He fears for his life and loses her on some back roads. The source admitted that he threw David's body down a mine shaft that he knew about in the desert. Detective King's source shows him where he left David's body, 84 miles from David's home. We went to the mine shaft and began the process of recovering the body. The body was in an advanced state of decomposition. The coroner relies on dental records for an identification and confirms that the body is, in fact, David Rathbun. The cause of death was undetermined, but the manner of death was by unknown homicidal means. We believe David was preparing to kick Charles and Jolene out of the house, but they were desperate, and they saw David as a, a cash cow, basically. And by getting rid of him, they could access all of his assets. On April 4th, 2020, I obtained arrest warrants for Jolene Hibbs and Charles Asuelo for murder, conspiracy to commit murder. If you've seen Jolene Hibbs or Charles Asuelo, please text or call our hotline. I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Now on every episode of In Pursuit, we're gonna tell you about some missing children that we desperately need your help to find and bring home to their families. Here's the first case. Four-year-old Lucian Mungia vanished from the Sarge Hubbard Park in Yakima, Washington at around 7.15 on September 10th, 2022. Authorities do not suspect foul play at this time, but are looking into all possibilities. Lucian has autism, but he is verbal and able to communicate. He's four feet tall, weighs 40 pounds, and he has long black hair. If you have any information about Lucian Mungia, please text or call our hotline. The recovery of David Rathbun's body is the end of a long, painful journey. I felt just numbness at that point because as much as I knew I shouldn't have had hope, nothing's real until you have a body. And I remember just shutting down at that point. A part of it is relief because we're able to have some sort of closure still no justice. The FBI investigation, which started after the sale of David's house, now kicks into high gear. I think it's likely that Jolene Hibbs and Charles Asuelo have not strayed too far. They did not have significant means at their disposal, nor a significant background to allow them to stay on the run. At this point, they may not be easy to recognize with the drug use that they were involved with play a factor in significantly aging a person. It's likely that they do look different today than they did the last time we have a picture of them. All we need is that one breadcrumb, that one piece of information to set us back on the trail and we will track it to its conclusion. It's been a long five years since David Rathbun's life was taken. He could just be so fun. I can very vividly remember him dancing in the car to his music, jamming out in the car to his songs. He was just enjoying his life. You know, we never got to say goodbye. We weren't planning for it. He wasn't old. He was living his best life, hiking up a storm in, in Las Vegas. He was a healthy man. So 
to have to go to his funeral and know that it was because he was murdered. It was probably one of the hardest days of my life. David Rathbun was showing compassion to someone down on their luck, and police believe these two took advantage of him and most likely took his life. We can't let him get away with it. So let's catch these dirtbags and get some justice for David's daughters. Authorities believe Jolene Hibbs and Charles Oswello might not be a couple anymore, but they could still be in the greater Las Vegas area. Jolene is 5'2", Charles is 5'8". And the last time they were seen, she was 120 pounds and Charles was around 180. But police believe they are also drug users, so their appearances may have changed drastically. Take a look at this artist's rendering of what they could look like today. So if you've seen Jolene Hibbs or Charles Oswello, text or call our hotline. I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Now, our next case is very personal to me. As the heartbroken father of a murdered child, this one has haunted me for more than 15 years. The Boca Raton Town Center mall killings shocked the whole nation when they happened back in 2007. With three separate attacks in nine months, the youngest victim being just seven years old. Now, I've come to know these families, and I'm not gonna stop fighting for them. This time, my son Callahan and I are going back to the beginning, reviewing all the facts, talking to those closest to the investigation, hoping to trigger a memory, or convincing that one person to come forward and finally put this case to rest once and for all. In the early afternoon of March 23rd, 2007, 52-year-old Randy Gorenberg went shopping at Town Center Mall in the heart of Boca Raton, Florida. Upon leaving, Randy was carjacked, shot to death, and dumped in a public park. Approximately five months later, a second brutal abduction occurred at the mall. But this time, the female victim and her two-year-old son survived. Finally, in December of that year, a third attack took place at the mall when 47-year-old Nancy Bokikio and her seven-year-old daughter, Joey, were bound and murdered execution style in Nancy's vehicle. The only real lead after 15 years of cop work, a crude sketch of the attacker. While many of the details were similar, the Boca Raton Police Department has been reluctant to categorize these attacks as serial crimes. More than a decade later, no one seems to know who attacked these vulnerable mothers. How are you? And why? Long time no see. Randy Gornberg's mother, Idy, is still searching for answers. I am oldest son. Tell me a little bit more about your daughter. Everybody that I talk to that's ever ran into mm -hmm. her knows or feels the same way, that she was a very special, kind person. Yes, she was. Randy turned 52 like two weeks before this happened. Such a loving mother. She was a good wife. She was good to everybody. You know, she was that kind of a thoughtful person. On March 23rd, 2007, did you know what she was doing that day? She got up in the morning and she said she had to go to town center. She was going out that night and she wanted to go buy a pair of shorts or something. How did you find out what had happened? to Randy. I'm watching the 5 o'clock news, and the announcer says, um, we found this body of a young woman. And it's about 5.30. The phone rings, and it's my son-in-law. And he said, Idy, I want you to come over to the house right away. So I drive up to the house, and I see loads of police cars surrounding the house there under the portico is sitting my grandson on the ground and he's crying. I get out of the car and I say, what happened? What's going on? And he says to me, mommy's gone, mommy's gone. I said, I said what, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean mommy's gone? And he said, she's gone, grandma, she's gone. So sorry so sorry. When police are there, what did they tell you had happened to Randy? 
The last time they saw her was on a camera. She was leaving the Neiman Marcus department store, but her car was parked further away than the cameras could catch her. We don't know what happened. Was she kidnapped? I can't believe that no one remembers or saw anything. Maybe they pulled her into the car. Somebody had to see something. Why did God take her? Why did he break my heart? You could spend the rest of your time anguishing over that like I do. Yes, but my religion says you must forgive, but I can't. Why did you do this to her? I can't forgive him. This dirtbag has to be stopped. And I'm gonna tell him again. I'm gonna tell him about your daughter. I'm gonna remind the world what happened. Thank you. If you have any information on the suspect of the 2007 Boca Raton Town Center Mall murders, please text or call our hotline. I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Here's the next 15 seconds of shame. Jose Ortega is wanted in La Puente, California for the attempted homicide of three police officers in August 2022. The 25-year-old is six foot one and weighs 290 pounds. If you've seen Ortega, please text or call us. Randy Gorenberg's body was discovered in Delray Beach, Florida, behind the South County Civic Center, some five miles away from where she was abducted. Palm Beach County Sheriff's Detective Bill Springer has walked the crime scene plenty since becoming an investigative lead in 2007. It's been a long time. 15 years since yeah. I've seen you. Yeah. Bill, you, you've been involved with this case from the get-go. Take us through the timeline of Randy Gorenberg. On March 23rd, 2007, she went to the town center mall in Boca. And about 1.16, we have her leaving the mall. And from that point on, we don't know where she was until 1.54 when we get the call that there's shots fired and there's a lady on the ground. So obviously you got all that from video at the mall. Yes, and then we have uh, some video from out here too at the scene and where the car was eventually dumped. Investigators believe Randy was shot in the head after a failed attempt to access her bank account using an ATM. The killer dumped her body and abandoned her vehicle in a nearby parking lot. Did this seem like to you a, a, a random crime, a crime of opportunity, or something that was more personal? We believe robbery was a motive, but everything he had planned just went down the drain, and I think he panicked. We learned that Randy didn't have an ATM card because all they used was their credit cards, and probably he was pretty upset. So I'm pretty sure that if she said to him, I don't have a debit card, he probably not believe her. Game over. Yeah. There was probably an altercation, looking for the debit card. Possibly he was coming up here for her to write a check to get cash at the bank. And when he pulled in, she's fighting him because she figures now's the opportunity I can get away. Right. And when she went to jump out, he shot her. So where exactly was her body found? She was found right over in here. Right here? Yeah. She was either trying to get out and he shot her, or he shot her, then just pushed her out. Threw her out like a piece of garbage. And took off, yes. Wow. Right in broad daylight. Yeah. Horrible, cold-blooded guy. There was no reason to kill her, none whatsoever. In 2007, Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office believed that Randy Gorenberg's murder was a random act of violence and not a targeted attack. The pressure from the community to solve the case became even greater when five months later, another attack happened at the Town Center Mall. In August 2007, a woman authorities referred to as Jane Doe and her two-year-old son were held at gunpoint in the mall parking lot. The mother and child miraculously survived the attack and were able to give law enforcement a description of their attacker, a Hispanic male wearing a floppy military-style boonie hat, dark sunglasses, and a long brown ponytail. 
A sketch was released to the public that generated hundreds of tips, but again, no solid leads. And neither police nor the media made connections between the two cases. It wasn't until December 2007 when 47-year-old Nancy Bokikio and her seven-year-old daughter, Joe, were abducted from the same mall parking lot and gunned down that citizens like Nancy's sister, Joanne Bruno, began to take notice. Your sister, Nancy, what was she like? She was funny. She had a heart of gold. Her and Joey both, they really did. We were always close. Did you see them that day, Nancy and Joey? She was driving Joey to school, and then she dropped her off, and I'd meet her for coffee. So I was with her that morning, and I was on the phone with her when she was in the mall. How did you come to find out what had happened to Nancy and Joey? I didn't see her that night, and I kept calling and calling, and I got no answer. Five o'clock in the morning, I put on the news and I saw a black SUV, and they said that there were um, two women at the mall, and this happened to them. They said two women, so I never associated it. And I called her job, and they said she's not there. And all of a sudden, I started screaming, and I said, that's them at the mall. And I got in the car immediately, and I ran through the police station. They brought me in a room. And when they told me, it was the worst moment of my life. That's how I knew. I'm so sorry. It's the worst nightmare. You Keep understand? Walking. I know. I know. Similar to the Randy Gorenberg case, surveillance video captured Nancy and Joey leaving the mall at 3.11 p.m. Within three minutes, Nancy tried to call 911, but the call disconnected. Five minutes later, at 3.19 p.m., Nancy withdrew $500 at an ATM machine. That was the last time Nancy and Joey were seen alive. At that point, was law enforcement telling you about any of the other cases that had happened with similarities? I Jane didn't Doe? know about that. Jane Doe they never told you that after. Police never told you that there was an attempt before involving a woman and a two-year-old child. Yes, they told me after. And what did you think about that? I was very angry at the mall, and I was very angry at the press because they kept it so quiet. There's pages and pages of crime that has gone on in that mall, and it's all quiet. That makes me very angry. All these things that my sister didn't get to see that Joey didn't get to have. We're gonna get that son of a bitch. Oh, please, I hope so. I really... When asked about specific details linking all the cases, the Boca police have always had the same response that they cannot comment on an open investigation. But the FBI, which joined the investigation due to their jurisdiction over carjacking, were willing to talk with us. Hey, welcome. Hey, John. Good. Nice Retired Special well, Agent well, John well, McVeigh well, has been working diligently alongside Thank Detective you. Springer to bring justice to all three women and their children. The victims in this case, mm -hmm. why them? Why do you think they were the ones preyed upon? I think it was totally Wrong place, wrong time. I mean, it, it, it could have been anybody walking out the door. Here's a woman with a seven-year-old, or here's a woman with a three-year-old. He picked somebody that he thought he could manipulate with a child. Yeah. With Jane Doe, she puts her son in the car, and then she opened the, the latch, the back trunk, mm -hmm. and she put her stroller in and stuff. And by the time she walks back around, he's already sitting in the car. And I think the same thing happened with Joey and Nancy. He jumps in. And now he's controlling Joey. Yeah. And what's Nancy going to do? She's going to get in, of course. Investigators discovered other similarities in the cases. Jane Doe told them her abductor used handcuffs and zip ties to bind her hands and feet, blacked out swim goggles to blindfold her, duct tape for her mouth, 
and a handgun. Police say the same type of kidnap kit was used on Nancy and Joey, and they don't believe it's all about robbery. And all the crap that he was doing, it was never really about the money. It was no sexual uh, Correct. assault. There's something else going right. on. Right, it's a control thing. Randy, he fought her and ended up killing her. And then with Jane Doe, he picks somebody with a small child that now I really can control them. She cooperated, but said that the child was crying, whining. And I think then he got the, the feeling, OK, well, my next step is I need somebody maybe with a little older kid that's not going to cry. But I still can gonna, control the but situation. But I still can control the situation. The and he picks Nancy and Joey. And he was getting better at his game. Yeah. Oh, definitely. This was a hunter. This is a hunter of women and children, a thrill killer who planned it and had a kill kit. Yeah. He's a sociopath doing it for the game. If you have any information on the suspect of the 2007 Boca Raton Town Center Mall murders, please text or call our hotline. I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Here's the next missing child case. Chaiki Mia Pate was last seen on the evening of September 4th, 1998, near her home in Unadilla, Georgia. After an intense search, authorities cleared family and neighbors of suspicion. Chaiki Mia has never been seen again. She has a surgical scar along her waistline. This age-progressed photo shows Chaiki Mia at her current age, 32 years old. If you've seen Chaiki Mia Pate, please text or call our hotline. Nancy and Joey Bocchicchio's murders spurred authorities to offer the largest cash reward in Florida history at the time, $400,000, for information leading to an arrest. By the beginning of 2008, just about everyone in the Sunshine State knew what happened to Nancy, Joey, and Randy. Yet law enforcement was no closer to finding out who killed them. When you're investigating the Jane Doe case and Bokikio murders, initially, were you looking at them as, as separate or were you looking at them connected in some way? Totally connected. We had 2,000 leads. A lot of those leads were, I saw somebody matching the composite. You know that 99.9% .9 of them didn't amount to anything. The FBI finally caught a break when it examined remnants of the perpetrator's kit found in the victim's vehicles. They traced the handcuffs and goggles to national retailers. Both items sold everywhere by the tens of thousands. But they found the zip ties and duct tape were specific to one hardware store further south in the Miami area. The big thing was the duct tape that was in the vehicle that was used to blindfold Joey. The company who makes it had sent this duct tape in a pack of three to Miami stores only so it might have been that the person frequent there, they lived down there, something. I mean, in Jane Doe, they took her to a bank first that had no drive through She actually mentioned, OK, there's another bank over on the other side. Go there. So that's when he went to the other side and got the ATM withdrawal. It clearly showed to me that he wasn't too familiar with the area. He gets lost. He knew more about South Florida than he did about north of that mall. Yeah. The police sketch that was released to the public, did that information solely come from Jane Doe? Yes. It did. She was always adamant that he was Hispanic. She clearly described that he had a baby face, mm -hmm. you know, very little facial hair at all. What profile would you give this guy today? Nancy had broken the cuffs and, and gone after him. Randy fought back. To be that quick to shoot somebody, yeah. um, you know, you got to have a terrible violent history. Somebody that's meticulous, this is a loner. This is someone who has no conscience. I agree with you. With a cold, calculating sociopath, once you've crossed that horrible, no turn back line of killing a child, you're capable of doing anything at any time. And you don't stop. Right. I can't let this one go, and I know you can't either. This is the guy that got away. I can't forgive him for doing this to her and to us. I can't. Having that kind of hatred in your heart is very hard, especially if your heart is broken already. I want him caught before I die. 
because it breaks my heart that Nancy died tortured, Joey died tortured, and priests tell me over and over that when you go to heaven, you don't know any sorrow. But I know my sister. And I know she doesn't even have peace in the next life. Not until he's gone. Now, I don't take any case lightly, but when women and children are hunted and killed in broad daylight, that takes us to a whole different level. Now, our description of the suspect is dated, but in 2007, the town center mall killer was reportedly about six feet tall with a regular build. His hair was dark and he wore it in a ponytail and had no visible facial hair. He was described to be in his late 20s or early 30s and of Hispanic or Pacific Islander descent. Now, obviously, this guy's not walking around wearing the same hat, but somebody knows something. If you or someone you know survived a similar type of robbery, no matter how inconsequential you think that tip is, it could be the one that breaks this case. Sociopathic killers like this don't quit. So if you have any information about the Boca Raton Town Center Mall murders, make that call or text me. And please don't forget, there's a $400,000 reward, and I guarantee you can remain anonymous. Now, let's not forget the other cases we told you about earlier tonight. First off, there's Jolene Hibbs and Charles Oswello, on the run since late 2017, a couple from Las Vegas that police believe are responsible for the death of David Rathbun. Then there's Ronald Folks, Jose Ortega, Lucian Munguia, and Shaiki Mia Pate. Thanks a lot for watching, and please remember, you can make a difference. I'm John Walsh, 